Good morning, and welcome to Ozark Community Church this morning. I'm just going to start by reading from Psalm 28, verses 7 to 8. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to the Lord. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this morning. I thank you that you are our shield. I thank you that you are our God, that we can trust in you, that we can take refuge in you. And Lord, I just pray that you would quiet our hearts this morning, that you would fill us with praise to you, thanksgiving for who you are and all that you do in our lives and in this world. And Lord, I just thank you for this morning. In your name, amen. Please stand with us as we worship God this morning. <clears throat>
Amen. You may be seated. Great. Please stand with us as we continue worship this morning. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the
Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are a God who forgives when we come to you in repentance. And I just pray that you'd be with Willie as he brings your word to us this morning. Just anoint his words and speak to our hearts, Lord. Help us to have ears that are ready to hear and hearts that are ready to obey. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, Psalm 51, if you look at the heading on Psalm 51, talks about this is Nathan's encounter with David after he had gone in to Bathsheba. And uh, I will be reading this text a little later on in the sermon. So that is my text, Psalm 51. <clears throat> Uh, please ponder these next four words. We never sin alone. We never sin alone. We may be alone when we sin, but we never sin alone. Our sin, our compromise, our deceit can infect and injure our spouse, our children, our relationship with family and friends, can affect our careers, our future, can cause physical and mental health. Living with the guilt of sin will rob you of your sleep and cause anguish of your soul. It had been a messy affair, literally. But now at last, things seem to be going well. After all, who could fault a king for indulging in his fantasies? That's what kings do. One night you go out for a stroll, you see a beautiful woman, you want her, you send for her, <clears throat> she comes to you, you sleep with her. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> Kings have been doing that sort of thing since the beginning of time. Whatever the king wants, he gets. That's why they call him the king. And on that day, in that time, it shouldn't have seemed like a big deal. It still happens today. Who among us is ever really surprised when we find out a president or a prime minister has a girlfriend on the side? It doesn't happen all the time. But it does happen. When people hear about it, they shrug their shoulders and say, well, it's kind of normal for them. Not to justify things, just to observe that this is the way things are. And the king felt that things had finally settled down. There was that problem with the woman's husband not an easy thing to get rid of. He was a loyal soldier, and he couldn't easily be tricked. So the king had him killed in battle. Complicated in a way, but the man ended up like a hero in his death. He fought to the bitter end, and no soldier would come to his aid. I'm really saddened by that. No soldier came to his aid. And the commander, Joab, he was a part of this plot. And I'm sure that moment, that day, Joab's estimation of King David went way down because he knew what was going on. So after the man is dead, her husband, the king felt free to take the woman as his wife. And so he did. Then came the happy news. She's pregnant. All was right with the world. But then, we have one of the most sobering verses in Scripture, in 2 Samuel 11, verse 29, where it says, The thing David had done displeased the Lord. The king was about to learn the hard way that God is not mocked. And in Numbers 23, I mean 32, verse 23, it says, Be sure 
your sin will find you out. And so here comes Nathan, the prophet, God's messenger. Now Nathan knows that he has to be a little uh, uh, cautious about how he is going to approach the king. After all, the king can have him killed. And so Nathan tells him a little story about a rich man who has many flocks of sheep. And then there's a poor man who has only one little lamb. And the rich man goes and steals the poor man's little lamb and serves it for dinner for someone else. So Nathan asks the king, what should be done to that man? And the king in his anger says, he should be put to death. And then Nathan says, you are the man. In a moment, in one heart-stopping instant, the king knew the truth of what Nathan was saying. He knew that he was the rich man who had cheated the poor man. The king knew. Very quickly comes the word of the Lord. I gave you everything you had. I made you the king. If this was not enough, I would have given you more. Why did you despise my word? You took this man's wife. You had him murdered. There will be nothing but trouble for you from this day forward. Your family will suffer because of your sin. And then came the worst news. Your son will die. The king wept and fasted and prayed, but the child died. Then came the time for the king to do the hardest thing anyone can ever do, to look in the mirror and say, I have sinned. Those may be the three hardest words in the English language. No one wants to say, I have sinned. We'd rather do anything than to admit that. But there is no way of getting right until we admit how badly we have done wrong. To what lengths have you gone to cover up your sin? I have sinned. The words are so universal that they belong to anyone whose heart is broken because of sin. Through his tears and deep guilt, reproaching himself for his sinful folly, realizing at last how wrong he had been, King David sat down and wrote the poem we call Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 1 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. It is interesting that King David himself records this sin for us. 
It must have been a painful and humiliating experience for him. Now, 3,000 years later, we come back to it again and again because it tells us what it means to come back to God when we have sinned. It has been the lifeline back to God for generations of believers, first among the Jews who learned it and recited it and sang it, then among Christians who have adopted it as their own. The words are so universal that they belong to anyone whose heart is broken because of sin. If you have blown it, here is a word of God for you. If you look at the wreckage of your life, knowing full well that you are guilty of many foolish choices, if you despair of ever finding forgiveness, here we find hope. So let us journey together through Psalm 51 and see what it says to us today. There are three parts to this great prayer. First, David confesses his sin in verses 1 to 6. Then he prays for cleansing, verses 7 to 12. And then he offers a prayer of consecration, verses 13 to 19. So we can break it down to confession, cleansing, and consecration. Warren Wearsby says David puts, prays three things in Psalm 51. Forgive me, cleanse me, and use me. If your sin feels like a weight upon your shoulders, this psalm is for you. David begins with God in verses 1 to 2. He cries out to God's mercy, love, and compassion to blot out his transgressions and wash away his iniquity. The time for excuses is over. There can be no rationalization for adultery and murder. No more saying kings do it all the time, or I fell in a moment of weakness. As long as a man makes excuses, he cannot be forgiven because he will not come clean about his sin. If you feel like you need to justify your sin or make excuses for your sin, you are not ready to be forgiven. God does not make deals. He doesn't say, boys will be boys, or I understand how weak you are, so I'll let it go this time. If sin is to be forgiven, it must be confessed for what it is. You can't call sin weakness and expect to be forgiven by God. God doesn't forgive weakness. He only forgives sin. That's why the king piles up four different words to express the depth of his sin. Transgression, iniquity, sin, and finally, evil. When Andy Weave spoke here some, quite some time ago, he spoke about the progression of David's sin. I found it very interesting in how he explained the progression of David's sin. Now looking into the cesspool of his own heart, he sees nothing good, nothing to diminish his enormous crimes. In verse 4, David says an, extraordin an extraordinary thing. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Had he not sinned against Uriah, not once but twice? Yes. Had he not sinned against Bathsheba by stealing her husband from her? Yes. Had he not sinned against the people of Israel? Yes. But finally, he had to deal with God. All sin is rebellion against the Almighty. Until we grasp that and until we see it and feel it and until we confess it, we cannot be forgiven. So David says, you are right to judge me. I do not question your ways. And then he says, I've been a sinner all my life, in verse 6, and I know you desire truth from the inside out. You know, the truth can be hard to handle, especially the truth about ourselves. We know the truth. We don't want to let it hurt us. So we deflect it, ignore it, deny it, attack it, argue with it, and in general avoid it in any way that we can. We put up a shield so we can deflect the incoming bullets of truth. And after a while, we get so good at deflection that the truth never gets through to us at all. We hear the truth. God speaks to us, either through his sermon or through words of scripture or through our own conscience. We know the truth, but we deflect or ignore the truth so it never gets close enough to hurt us. Therefore, we are not set free. We are still angry, stubborn, bitter, greedy, arrogant, filled with lust, self-willed, critical, and unkind. 
The truth never really changes us because we won't let it get close enough to, for it to hurt us. Honesty is the first step to admitting your true condition. When David cried out for God's mercy, he acknowledged the true source of the problem and where healing must begin. Until there is, until there is truth, the word means something like reality as opposed to making excuses, covering up, and pretending everything is okay in the inner recesses of our soul, as long as we lie to ourselves, we can never get better. And God cannot teach us wisdom. Would you like to be set free? It can happen. But you'll have to let the truth hurt you first. How we respond when we have sinned reveals a great deal about the reality or the unreality of our profession of faith. David is saying, I know what you want, Lord. You want me to stop playing games and stop making excuses. I'm ready to do that. No more excuses, no more games. I'm guilty in your eyes, and I admit it. Now, how can we know if someone is really a Christian? That's always a difficult question, because people and circumstances differ so greatly. And sometimes people look differently up close than from a distance. Now, Psalm 51 suggests a principle that seems universally true, even if it's not always seen or easily seen by others. How we respond when we have sinned reveals a great deal about the reality or the unreality of our profession of faith. When a great and grievous sin or even a small sin has been com committed, the question always arises, how do we know if repentance is genuine? How do we know if repentance is genuine? Spurgeon says this. When the repentance is as notorious as the sin itself. When the repentance is as notorious as the sin itself. Now, you may not know what he's meaning with that, but I'll explain it. Suppose I have sinned against another person. And if I say, Lord, please forgive me. In the name of Jesus, I sinned against this person. And you don't go and talk to the other person? That's not genuine. If I've sinned against my wife, and I say, Lord, please forgive me. I hurt Agnes today by being cruel to her, and I don't go and apologize to her. That's not repentance. If I come before the whole church in a meeting and blow it, and really blow it, lose my temper, then my repentance has to go as far as the atrocity. In other words, then I would have to come before the whole church and apologize. So your repentance has to go as far as the atrocity of your sin. As many people as it has involved, that's how many people are involved in your repentance. Your repentance goes as far as the people that has affected not only does David not hide his sin, not only does he not minimize his sin, he begs God for a deep work of grace to cleanse him from the stain of sin. He wants God to wash him from the inside out. Because he wrote this psalm himself, he clearly does not care who knows what he has done and how desperately he seeks the grace of God. Now, true confession is a very, very humbling experience. It must have been a painful and humbling experience for King David to record this. Now, we go to great lengths to hide our sin and put up a front as if we don't struggle with sin. Why? Because we are afraid. What will the people think of me if I tell them what's going on in my life? That's what we're afraid of. What will they think of me? Because I'm ashamed of it myself.
I know that's a humiliating experience. Now, how many of us haven't been at a baptism where a person is sharing their testimony with tears and remorse, who has experienced a brokenness over their sin and is begging God for forgiveness and sharing with the church how God has forgiven them and the joy that they now experience because they are confident that Christ has forgiven them and they have eternal life living in them. They say Jesus has paid for all their sin and they've been forgiven and they now have joy. So what do you think of that person? After they've said that. Well, what do we do? We welcome them with open arms. We hug them. We shake their hands. We say, welcome to the church. We're happy for them. We're really happy for them. We don't think any less of them. When the thing that matters is getting free from the burden of sin, it doesn't matter who knows about it anymore. It doesn't matter. It is not as if people think less of you. Why? Because if people were really honest, they would say, I experienced the same thing. Or I've done the same thing. When we no longer sugarcoat our sin, when we desperately seek restored fellowship with God and with his people, we no longer worry about our reputation. When what God thinks matters more than what others think, then we will find forgiveness that we seek because our repentance has led us back to the Lord. If you look at the request David makes in verses 7 to 12, you can clearly see a sevenfold path of restoration. In verse 7, it says, he, he re records this. We, uh, what he says is, we need to be cleansed by the blood. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Now, hyssop was a plant used in the first Passover in Egypt, according to Exodus 12, verse 22. The Jews dipped the hyssop in the blood of a lamb and then smeared the blood on the doorpost. When the angel of death saw the blood, he passed over that house, and no one died that night. A lamb had to die in order to save that household from death. Now, Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb, whose blood now washes away our sins so that we have eternal life. Now, writing about this, Ray Steadman notes that many people wonder why Jesus had to die for us. The cross of Jesus offends the sensibilities of many people who prefer a bloodless religion. Now, here is Steadman's answer. Why did Jesus have to die to forgive our sins? The only answer is sin is so deeply embedded in us that it can be cured by nothing else than death. The old life has to die. God cannot improve it. Even God cannot make it better. He cannot cleanse it or wash it. He can only put it to death. Now, David understands, not, understands that now. He says to God, if you're going to deal with this terrible fountain of evil in me, I see that it must be put to death. It must be purged with hyssop. Then I will be clean. Now, it took the death of Jesus so that I have the power to die to sin. And we look, and look at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, where it says this. Romans 6, 1 to 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer than therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, and that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says that I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself 
for me. You know, many people say that I can't get over the addictions that I have in my life. I don't have the power to do it. You're right, you don't have the power to do it. Because in reality, you have no power at all. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says that God has given us divine power. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. The knowledge, through the knowledge of him that hath called us, you have been given all things to live a life that pertains to godliness through power in Christ. The second thing that if we, uh, we find in verse 8 says we need new hope. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bo bones you have crushed rejoice. What Psalmist is kind of saying, Lord, I've been down so long, I see nothing but darkness. Shine your light in my heart so that I can sing with joy once more. In verse 9, it says, we need to know that our sins are forgiven. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. It's not enough to be just forgiven. We need to know that God has put our sins away from us. Otherwise, our sins will arise and create a guilty conscience that will keep us awake at night. Now, if you've confessed your sin, you need to, by faith, claim the promises of God and know that your sin has been removed. If you don't believe that, you're going to live a very, very frustrated life. A very frustrated life. When God says, I have blotted out your transgression, like a thick cloud, I don't see them anymore, I bury them in the depths of the ocean, and you keep bringing them up, What's the point of even confessing it? What's the point? You can confess it over and over and over and over again. That's just like accepting the Lord over and over again. I've done that. You know, I didn't know for sure if I was saved or not. So I accepted the Lord again, and then again, and then again. And finally, I read a verse in 1 John 5 that says that we can know that you have eternal life living in you. Wow, you can know that. Okay, if I know that, then I quit doing that. So, live by faith. It says the just shall live by his faith. We need new hope. We need a clean heart, according to verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The word create means that David knows he can't change himself. Here is the end of all self-reformation. The king knows that unless God makes him pure, he will never get there on his own. Not only that, but he prays for a steadfast spirit that will enable him to stand strong against temptation in the future. In verse 11, we need the restoration of the Holy Spirit's power. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, some have interpreted this verse as if you can lose your salvation. This is not what it is saying. I do not think that what, that's what it says at all. Neither King David is praying that the fellowship and assurance of the Holy Spirit would, restore, would be restored to him as it was before. When you read Psalm 32, you understand that he feels as if God is far away from him. And it's as if he can't even get close to God. It's not as if his prayers are even being answered. His prayers aren't even heard. And now he wants that spiritual life to be he wants assurance that that spiritual life that he had will be restored to him. In Hebrews 13, verse 5, it says that I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we know that your Holy Spirit won't be taken from you. But you can lose the fellowship of the Spirit. In verse 12, it says we need to regain the joy of God's salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Every sin, whether big or small, separates from happy, a happy relationship with God. It is perfectly possible to be saved and miserable because we do not deal rightly with our sin. David says, Lord, I'm tired of being miserable about my miserable life. Open the fountain of joy in my heart once again. Verse 12, it says, we need a new desire within. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. 
David means make me glad to obey you in the future. He begs God to do some divine heart surgery so he will never stray from the right path again. And this sevenfold path is the right road for every sinner who wants to find peace with God. Start with the blood of Jesus Christ, and you will end with new hope, new joy, and a new desire to serve the Lord. In verse 13, it talks about a new service. Teach, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Now, as David considered the lessons he had learned following the tragic affair with Bathsheba, he vowed to God that he would use his experience to cause sinners to return to the Lord. Wow. In other words, what David is saying, I'm going to use my sordid past and tell others of my sordid past and how God has restored me and what God has done for me. And because of that, sinners will be converted. That's awesome. Do you realize that this psalm has created generations of Christians and non-Christians who have strayed to a renewed fellowship with the Lord? Until we have personally experienced God's pardoning grace, the gospel is to us only an imaginary message. But let a person declare how God rescued him from his moment of helpless desperation. Let him speak openly of how he despaired of ever finding peace with God. Let him tell how Jesus found him, lifted him up, forgave his sins, gave him new life, and set his feet in a new direction. Let him share that from his heart, and people will listen. Because there is no testimony like the simple truth of a changed life. Converted sinners make the best preachers because they know the truth of what they are saying. In verse 15, it talks about a new worship. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. David never forgot his sin or the grace that found him in the midst of his despair. His lips were shut until grace, like a river, came pouring down from heaven. And then he would not be silent. Truly forgiven people love to tell others what God has done for them. And in verse 16 to 17, it talks about a new understanding. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Now these verses forever banish the notion that God wants more religion. In the old days, it was the blood of bulls and goats. In modern times, it's church attendance and the offering plate. Now, you can go to church for a thousand Sundays in a row, and you won't be able, well, not one sin while yours will be forgiven. You can give your whole, whole paycheck to God, and you won't pay for one sin. You just won't. Now, David knew that no bull offered on the altar could ever atone for his sins of murder and adultery. What God wants is a broken and contrite heart. That he will not turn away from. And the title of my sermon reads this. How much sin will God forgive? Or to say another way, how far can we go in sin before God will not forgive us? The answer is, no one really knows because no one's ever gone that far. No matter how wicked you have been in the past, if you turn to the Lord, he will abundantly pardon you. If God forgave David, he will certainly forgive you. If a murdering adulterer could find grace, then there's hope for you and me. How much sin will God forgive? All of it. No sin is beyond God's grace if we turn to him with a broken and contrite heart. Forgiveness is always possible, but only for those who deal deeply and honestly with their own sin. I suppose the question comes down to this. Do you even want to be forgiven? I say even, because you can harden your heart to the point that you no longer care if you are forgiven. For such people, there is nothing left but the fearful judgment of God. But if you have the slightest desire to be forgiven, if in your heart you want a new beginning, your sins can be forgiven. It's not about you. It's not about your sin. 
It's all about God. It's all about his grace. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ who made it possible for our sins to be forgiven. Realize today, Lord, that your death on the cross has paid the penalty for my sin, for the sins of the whole world. We realize, Lord, that all we need to do is repent, have a brokenness over our sin, have a remorse over our sin, and we know that you will abundantly, abundantly pardon. So, Lord, that we are truly thankful this morning. We want to thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as we close our service this morning, as we walk in God's forgiveness, then his light can truly shine through our lives.
I think this morning something has been very clear to us. That you can't hide your sin. You can't hide from God. There have been people that have tried that. And it didn't work. If you're trying that, it's not going to work for you either. So the benediction comes from Jude 24, verse 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to only a wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and ever. Amen. Have a great week.